Good morning, brothers and sisters. We'll go ahead and get started so that we give Brother Sweat enough time for his excellent talk today. I'm delighted to have Anthony Sweat here. He grew up in West Valley City, Utah, and served a mission in Bolivia, La Paz. He received his PhD in curriculum and instruction in 2011 from Utah State University. Prior to joining the religion faculty at BYU, he worked for 13 years with seminaries and institutes of religion as a teacher and administrator. He loves to teach the gospel and is the author of several LDS books, including Mormons and Open Book. He and his wife, Cindy, are the parents of six children and reside in Springville, Utah. Brother Sweat. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm so excited to be with you. Um, if you were here for Brother Bennett's presentation, I'm a little bit like Charles Anthon. I pretend to know more than I really do. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk about this subject with you, uh, with those who had tangible interactions with Book of Mormon relics um, and objects. I love the Book of Mormon uh, very much. It's a huge, huge part of my life. I am a seventh generation Mormon. Um, my uh, great, 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 great grandfather, his name was John Sweat. He joined the church in 1833 in Kirtland, Ohio. He was the, as I like to joke around, he was the first sweaty man, and there's been seven generations of sweaty men in Mormonism ever since then. And um, this is a painting I did of him. Uh, some of you who know me know I'm also a painter and an artist. Um, my... Uh, uh, John Sweat went from Kirtland, or he, he was there in Kirtland, he was part, part of the Kirtland camp that left and went to Missouri to settle in Far West. He was there for a grand total of two weeks before we got exterminated from Missouri. Uh, John Sweat is on the records of uh, writing down that he lost uh, a certain property from being exterminated in one of the petitions. They then settled in Nauvoo and he settled on a little farm. This is actual, when I did this painting, this is a pic from a picture from where his farm would have sat relative to the Nauvoo Temple there. Uh, he was made a, made a high priest in 1845 and endowed and sealed to his wife, uh, who's standing there next to him. Uh, they then made the trip, uh, got ready to go with the saints. Uh, sadly, she got sick um, in Iowa and died. Uh, his wife did, and then he remained there in Iowa and when he got ready to go, they got onto the journey, and he went 18 miles west and died 18 miles into it, uh, probably from cholera, and was buried, which is why I painted that there. He was buried in a hollowed-out log uh, 18 miles west of the, uh, from where he started. Now, why do I share that with you? Uh, number one, because Mormonism is in my blood. Um, I'm, I'm such a Mormon that when I was born, the doctor didn't say it's a boy or a girl. He just held me up and said, it's a Mormon. <laughs> and uh, it, it is. It's just in, it's in my DNA. The other reason I wanted to share that with you is when I did this painting, if you can see closely here, um, I have him holding um, an original copy or an 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. I don't know whether he did or didn't, but I do have a letter that he wrote to one of his um, family members telling them that he knows that Mormonism, so-called, this is an exact quote, Mormonism, so-called, has got the gospel of truth. And uh, I know that as well. I'm so grateful to be part of this work. Uh, well, why do I want to share what I'm going to share with you today? I, um, the reason why is because people like uh, my ancestor, John Sweat, and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of others have given their lives so that you and I can enjoy the blessings of the restored gospel, so that you and I can have uh, the precious Book of Mormon and the faith that we share. Uh, sometimes there are those who want to explain the faith in different ways, uh, almost explain the faith away, uh, almost try to account for it in a different uh, way. And I want to share, this is, this is from uh, Robert Lopez, he is one of the people who uh, made the Book of Mormon musical. Robert Lopez, when they asked him, why did you choose Mormonism? Uh, why did you do the Book of Mormon musical, the hit one on Broadway that has given us uh, uh, both good and bad publicity, but sadly mocks a lot of what we hold sacred? Look what Robert Lopez says here. And I don't say this to belittle him, but I do, I do say that it reflects a certain line of thought. 
Quote, the reason why we both wanted to do Mormonism, talking about the other creators of the Book of Mormon musical, from the beginning is that we all felt the same way about religion. There is something supremely, ridiculously fake about it. But it helps people live their lives better. And there's something emotionally true about it. God does exist inside us, and quite demonstrably by the actions we take for good. But then notice what he says here. But you don't think God talked to this guy and had him bury some plates in the ground. That's ridiculous. But if believing in a goofy story helps a bunch of people lead lives in a meaningful way, then it's true, and that's where we started from. Now, that's an interesting quote to me. And, you know, he, he goes on to say that, yeah, we believe there's a higher power that motivates people for good, but believing in these stories of actual plates that actual people and prophets inscribed on and actually buried in the ground, and that Joseph Smith retrieved those plates and that they were real and that he translated them through Urim and Thummim, that's to use uh, Robert Lopez's words, goofy or ridiculous. And what's started to happen a little bit in our day is that there have been people who have wanted to try to bridge a middle ground. And once again, I say that respectfully because on the one hand, they can't deny that the Book of Mormon is extraordinary, that you can't account that this unlearned 23-year-old farm boy produced a record of this complexity um, by looking into a hat. Uh, most rational people who study the book and look at its content say, yeah, th th there's other, there has to be another explanation for this book. So they come up with Spalding theories and other, you know, Sidney Rigdon wrote it or Oliver Cowdery con contributed to it or but they know that this unlearned farm boy couldn't have produced this record in 65 working days on his own. Uh, so on the one hand, they have that. But on the other hand, they don't want to admit or they don't want to claim the historicity of the Book of Mormon. That there were actually people who came here from uh, Jerusalem, settled in the Americas, had a civilization, wrote on real records, buried them, and that Joseph actually retrieved them. Okay. So they, they, they try to bridge a middle ground and they say, well, the Book of Mormon isn't real. Like that's kind of ridiculous and we don't think there's really proof of that. But there's something divine. And so there's this thing that's emerged that sometimes is called the sacred fiction theory. And the sacred fiction theory says that the Book of Mormon is quote unquote true in the sense that it leads people to do good things and to be virtuous and live good lives. And they almost view it as inspired fiction that God inspired Joseph Smith to work up this, this record, um, but that it's not actual, tangible, real history. Okay, this is what sociologist Rodney Stark said, who has studied a lot about Mormon growth, the growth of Mormonism. He said, quote, suppose that someone with the literary gifts of William Shakespeare underwent a series of mental events he or she interpreted as contact with the supernatural. Would it be, not be likely that the revelations produced in this way would be messages of depth, beauty, and originality? The case of Joseph Smith is remarkably similar. So they, they, they want to think that Joseph is producing the Book of Mormon through some sort of just inspirational process, the same way Mozart or Shakespeare produced or Michelangelo produced their, their glorious works. Okay. Um, the problem with it, though, is that that is not how Joseph Smith explained the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith never said the Book of Mormon passed just through his mind, that, um, that God inspired him and that he dictated this text that came to him. He begins the story of the Book of Mormon by talking about physical relics, actual things, actual stones, actual plates um, that he pulls out of the ground, characters that he actually copies down and looks at. Okay? This is what Terrell Given said about those who are trying to weave the sacred fiction concept. Quote, this continual, extensive, and prolonged engagement with a tangible, visible, grounding artifact is not compatible with a theory that makes him an inspired writer reworking the stuff of his own dreams into a product worthy of the name of scripture. The story of the gold plates could not be fanciful mythology and the Book of Mormon still be scripture. Uh, to me, it's just logically inconsistent 
that Joseph Smith contrived this origin story of the Book of Mormon, and then he expects us to implicitly believe that the words in it are true. Uh, that doesn't make sense. If he's saying, no, I got this book, I went to a hill, I unearthed a stone, I pulled out plates, I protected them, I translated, and this is what the, where the record came from, that's one thing. But if he's just saying, yeah, this book just kind of came to me and I, I dictated it, and now I'm going to contrive an origin story, uh, that's logically inconsistent uh, to have a fake story of its origin but try to believe that the record or the message uh, is true. So my thesis or the premise that I want to talk about with you this morning is let's look at the historical record. Let's look at the people who were with Joseph when he unearthed the plates and how many of them said, no, I, not just Joseph, but I had a tangible interaction with the plates. I either hefted them or I saw them, or I touched them, or I heard them. They had sensory experiences testifying to us that Joseph isn't working this just fictionary from his mind, but that he's working from an actual artifact uh, that he recovered. So we're going to look at this time, if you can look at this chart. Uh, from the time that Joseph picks up the plates in September of 1827, I'm just, we're mainly going to focus in here on these three or four months uh, I like to call it the protection period. I think it's probably the most tangible time of the plates where we get the most people, other than the witnesses, the 11 witnesses. Th during this period, we almost get the most people saying, I either touched or saw or hefted uh, the artifact. Okay? And that's where we'll pick up from. So notice that Joseph, in his 1839 history, Joseph says, uh, quote, that he found the Book of Mormon plates, quote, under a stone of considerable size, and the plates were deposited in a stone box along with the Urim and Thummim and the breastplate as stated by the messenger. I love, by the way, the story uh, Mike McKay talked a little bit about it last night when Joseph goes to the, goes to the hill. When he goes to get the plates, uh, the very first thing he does is he goes to his mother and says, that night, it's around midnight, by the way, and uh, he goes and says to his mother, do you have a chest with a lock and a key? And his mother says, no. And I love that, by the way. How long has Moroni been trying to get Joseph prepared to get the plates? For four years. I mean, he is just like one of our students. The night before, he's like, oh, no, what am I going to do with this? And he goes to his mom and says, do you, do you? And his mom says, no. It's almost like he hasn't thought ahead to like, oh, I need to bring this home and protect this record. So then the next thing he does is, nor does he have a wagon. And so he takes, and I say that very politely, uh, read, he steals Josiah, or Joseph Knight's wagon. Joseph Knight has providentially, or coincidentally, showed up at the Smith's home because he knew that this was the day that Joseph was to get the record. And uh, when he goes to bed, Joseph takes Joseph Knight's wagon, and him and Emma take off to the hill. And I love the next morning, by the way, when Joseph Knight wakes up, and he sees that his horse and wagon are gone, he says, some rogue has stolen my horse and wagon. And little does he know, the rogue that stole it was the prophet of the restoration. Um, and uh, Lucy Maxsmith just tries to put him at ease. Oh, you don't know all the plates and places in the pasture that your horse could have wandered off on. And William, go find his wagon for him. And in the back of her mind, she's like, come on, Joseph, get back home. Well, Joseph had gone to the, plate, to the hill that night and what he says, he found a lever and unearthed a, a stone. And when he opened the stone, he says he looked in there and he beheld the plates and the interpreters and the breastplate. These are artifacts, tangible, touchable artifacts that he sees. Well, we know he doesn't bring them home uh, when he was 17, nor does he bring them home this night uh, because he realizes he doesn't have a place to store them in. He's going to hide them in a hollowed out birch log that first night and go retrieve them later. And I'll talk about that. But I want to draw your attention to the stone box because sometimes when you talk about evidences of the Book of Mormon, the stone box sometimes gets overlooked. For those who have been to the Hill Cumorah, have you ever wandered around the hill and gone like, I wonder where it was at on the hill? I wonder if we got some sort of a sonar and tried to look, could we find a stone box? Could we find where it was put in? Well, many people actually said they saw the stone box. And I want to share a few of those, and I'm grateful uh, to my friend Mike McKay for sharing some of these resources with me that he 
um, uh, uh, showed me after he'd done some of his work on his book, From Darkness Unto Light. Look how Joseph describes the stone box. Quote, the box in which they lay, the plates, was formed by laying stones together in some kind of cement. In the bottom of the box were laid two stones crossways of the box, and on these stones lay the plates and the other things with them. And this is what, as you can see here, it's, it's somewhat ironic that while some of the persecution of Joseph Smith later arose because didn't, people didn't believe he had plates, the original persecution of the prophet Joseph, his original problem was that people knew he had plates. People were convinced that he had obtained a divine record. And one of the ways that they knew it was because they had been to the hill themselves and they had seen the stone box from which the plates were taken. And let me share a few of these with you. This is according to an account named Willard Chase and there's primarily two people, Willard Chase and Samuel Lawrence. Willard Chase and Samuel Lawrence were Joseph's friends in Joseph's previous treasure-seeking ventures. When Joseph was a young seer developing his gifts, Willard Chase and Samuel Lawrence were some of the ones that he would look into a seer stone with to try to find buried treasures. Okay. Willard Chase later recollects when someone asks Willard Chase about it. This is what uh, Chase says. Uh, that prior to obtaining the record, Joseph had taken Samuel Lawrence to the Hill Cumorah and shown him the spot where the Book of Mormon plates were concealed in the stone box. Lawrence asked Joseph, quote, if he, Joseph, had ever discovered anything with the plates of gold. He said no. He then asked him to look in his stone to see if there was anything with them. He looked and said there was nothing. He, I interpret that to be Samuel Lawrence, told Joseph to look again and see if there was not a large pair of specks with the plates. He looked and soon saw a pair of spectacles, the same with which Joseph says, he translated the Book of Mormon. You have to read Willard Chase's reminiscence there a little skeptically uh, just because of Willard's position. But Willard Chase is saying he took Samuel Lawrence with him to the hill. And that Samuel Lawrence might have been one of the ones that Joseph wanted with him to retrieve the plates. But that Samuel Lawrence had been to the spot. And that through the Urim and Thummim, or through his seer stone, Joseph had looked and said, that's where the plates are, is right here along with another Urim and Thummim, uh, the interpreters or the spectacles. This was confirmed by Joseph Knight Sr. Look what Joseph Knight Sr. says in, one of his, in his later reminiscence. He said that Samuel Lawrence, quote, had been to the hill and knew about the things in the hill. And he, Samuel Lawrence, was trying to obtain them. David Whitmer also corroborates this. Look at David Whitmer says, when David Whitmer starts to stumble upon hearing about the Book of Mormon, he's interested in it, he goes into Palmyra, and he says, quote, I had conversations with several young men, it has to be Willard Chase and Samuel Lawrence, who said that Joseph Smith had, had certainly golden plates, and that before he attained them, he had promised to share them with them. By the way, can you see the problem here? Here Joseph is with Samuel Lawrence and Willow Chase, and previous to this they've gone on treasure-seeking ventures, and now Joseph has just pulled a record out of the ground, plates that have the appearance of gold. Well, what does Samuel Lawrence and Willow Chase want? They want part of it. They, they feel like that they're in a business venture with Joseph Smith, and that he owes them. Like, no, 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 we're partners. And if you unearthed it, we all unearthed it. Okay. So he had promised to share with them, but had not done so. And they were very much incensed with him. Said I, this is David Whitmer, how do you know that Joe Smith has the plates? They replied and note this. We saw the plates, or the place is what I think they mean as well, in the hill that he took them out of just as he described it to us before he obtained them. These parties were so positive in their statements that I began to believe there must be some foundation for the stories then in circulation all over the part of that country. So that's an interesting account that Willard Chase and Samuel Lawrence say, no, we've been to the hill. Samuel Lawrence in particular saying, I saw the spot, uh, even perhaps uh, the stone box from which they were uh, re uh, retrieved from. This is an interesting account with uh, a stone box anyway on the hill Cumorah from Martin Harris. 
Later on in Martin Harris's life, he shares this reminiscent account. Um, shortly after Joseph got the plates, Martin Harris goes with two friends to the Hill Cumorah to see if they can find any stone boxes with things in them as well. Martin Harris says, quote, they went to hunt for more stone boxes. Quote, um, and while they go there, and Martin doesn't say that this is the box that the Book of Mormon, the stone box that the Book of Mormon came from. Look what he says. Quote, indeed, we found a stone box. And they took a crowbar because they wanted to pry it up. And they, quote, broke off one corner of the box, end of quote. Harris concluded, quote, sometime that box will be found. And you will see the corner broken off. Martin's like, you'll find this ancient relic. And I broke it. And then he goes, then you will know that I have told the truth. So Martin has uh, what he would say, no, I, I saw a, at least a stone box on the Hill Cumorah as well and tried to, tried to pry it up and, and broke it. I don't have it in here because it's a somewhat dubious account. Um, I'll, I'll just read it to you and I'll, t I'll tell you why I didn't include it in here. But a number of years later, um, a man named Edward Stevenson of the Latter-day Saint faith travels back to Palmyra. And he goes there in 1870. And when he gets there in 1870, he said that uh, he went to the Hill Cumorah and was shown by a local resident where the stone box was. Okay, and then he says, this is what um, Edward Stevenson remembers. And remember, this is in 1870, so this is 40 years after the Book of Mormon's retrieved. Edward Stevens says, quote, questioning him closely, he, the local, stated that he had seen some good-sized flat stones that had rolled down and lay near the bottom of the hill. This had occurred after the contents of the box had been removed, and these stones were doubtless the ones that formerly composed the box that the Book of Mormon came in. I felt, Edward Stevenson says, I felt a strong desire to see these ancient relics, and told him, the local farmer, I would be much pleased to have him inform me where they were to be found. He stated that, he had that they had long since been taken away. In other words, this old farmer's recollection is, oh yeah, the stone box, yeah, that was there, and the hills washed, the, it washed up, and the stones rolled down to the bottom of the hill, and they were there for a while, but they're now gone. Now, I don't know how this local farmer would know that, that these are the actual uh, cement stones that, that made the box, but at minimum, uh, it shows that among the locals who were still there, that they, uh, they had knowledge of that there was a stone box uh, there at the Hill Camorra. Well, I want to move on to who perhaps is probably the first witness of the gold plates, other than Joseph Smith himself. And it's somebody that we might sometimes overlook. And it's a man named Josiah Stoll. Josiah Stoll was also at the Smith, the, uh, Smith Senior home, staying there with Lucy and Joseph Smith Senior the night that um, uh, Joseph Smith brought the plates back. Now, from you who remember the story, Joseph didn't bring the plates home the first night. He buried them in the log, came home, realized as a poor student that he had procrastinated his homework and needed to get a stone box, I mean a, um, a wooden box with a lock. So uh, he goes to work uh, to earn some money to do that, and, and, and later brings the plates home a few nights later. And that's when he's attacked by some people. And we get those great stories of him jumping over a log and holding the plates and beating people up. It's when I was a kid, I was like, man, Joseph is like a superhero. He, he can carry plates and knock people out at the same time. Well, when he gets home, rushed, he hands the plates through an open window in the Smith home. He runs up to the side of the house and has the plates wrapped in his linen frock because he was working um, digging a well and, and had wrapped them up in, in, in his frock that he was working and hands them through the window. Both Martin Harris and Lucy Mack Smith verify that, like, yeah, when he came home, he, he first handed the plates through the window. Um, Martin Harris recollects that it's Lucy who took the plates. Uh, Lucy doesn't say that herself, um, but Josiah Stoll says, no, he handed the plates to me. So Josiah Stoll becomes the first person the plates go from Moroni to Joseph to a birch log to Josiah Stoll momentarily. And Josiah Stoll says when he takes the plates, he takes them in and they're wrapped and a part of Joseph's frock falls off and he sees the plates. Okay, look, at, look what he says right here. 
He says, quote, wrapped in his little frock, quote, at the very end of that quote, first person that took the plates out of Joseph's hands the morning he brought them in. And this is, um, I'm going to read the full account. Look what he says here. He saw a corner of the plates. It resembled a stone of greenish cast. And I'm going to read this from um, Mike McKay and Garrett Dirkmoth's book because I think it's interesting. He said that in the summer of 1830, Joseph had been arrested in Colesville and, uh, 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 for being a disorderly person and put on trial. And they bring Josiah Stoll to testify at the trial. And this is from Mike McKay and Garrett Dirkmoth's book. Quote, in the summer of 1830, after Joseph was charged with, being, with disorderly conduct, Stoll was called by the defense and sworn in as a witness. He testified under oath that he saw the plates the day Joseph first brought them home. As Joseph passed, through the, passed them through the window, Stoll caught a glimpse of the plates as a portion of the linen was pulled back. Stoll gave the court the dimensions of the plates and explained that they consisted of gold leaves with characters written on each sheet. The printed transcript of the trial reads, quote, witness saw a corner of it. It resembled a stone of greenish cast, end of quote. And then uh, um, Mike and Garrett say this, because Stoll also mentioned in a statement that the record was made of plates of gold, it is difficult to know what he meant by this description. He may have seen the band that sealed two-thirds of the plates together, which may have been made of copper that had oxidized over the years and turned green. Um, Kind of interesting, though. But nonetheless, Josiah Stoll, if you ask Joseph, is he making, like, are the plates, is the Book of Mormon coming through inspired fiction? He would say, no, it's coming off plates. I held them. For all intents and purposes, Josiah Stoll, we could almost call him the ninth witness of the eight witnesses. Although he didn't get to open the plates up and thumb through them as the eight witnesses did, he got to heft them, touch them, feel them, and he even saw them. Uh, saw the plates, a corner of them anyway, as they were being handed through the window. Well, I want to move on to Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph's mother. She also says that she has an interaction with tangible artifacts. And uh, she says this, that when Joseph came home and brought home the breastplate and the Urim and Thummim, Lucy says, quote, he handed me the breastplate spoken of in his history. It was wrapped in a thin muslin handkerchief, so thin that I could see the glistening metal and ascertain its proportions without any difficulty. It was concave on one side and convex on the other and extended from the neck downwards as far as the center of the stomach of a man of extraordinary size. It had four straps of the same material for the purpose of fastening it to the breast, two of which ran back to go over the shoulders and the other two were designated to fasten to the hips. They were just the width of my two fingers, for I measured them. You can almost picture, you know, Lucy handling this thing. And how wide are those, you know? Two fingers. They were just the width of my two fingers. And they had holes in the end of them to be convenient in fastening. After I had examined it, Joseph placed it in the chest with the Yerman Thummim. Once again, this is a fascinating record of his mother saying, no, I, I touched real artifacts. Joseph said, with the plates were stones and a breastplate. And he handed me the breastplate. Makes me wonder why he handed her the breastplate under uh, a sheet that was so thin that she could see right through it. But nonetheless, this is so detailed that if this is not real, if these artifacts are not real, where is she getting these dimensions from? Is the Lucy Max Smith delusional as well? I don't think so. She's having real experiences, tangible experiences with real artifacts, and she's giving us her account of what she experienced with them. Not only did Lucy see the breastplate, Lucy was also handed the Nephite interpreters, the stones that came with the Book of Mormon. Now, when Joseph didn't bring the plates home on the first night, Joseph, in his, uh, in his joking way, I, l- I love when Joseph Smith says that he had a a native cheery temperament, that he was jovial. Uh, Because even with something as sacred as the Book of Mormon, he's still joking around the first night when he comes back and um, they ask him if he had got the plates. And Joseph shakes his head and says, I surely am disappointed. I am disappointed. 
And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. You didn't get the record. And Joseph goes, it's 10 times better than I thought it was. Like, he's, he's joking around that night. He can see that his mother is anxious that he didn't get the record that first night when he comes back because he doesn't bring it home with him. So he grabs his mother and says, Mom, everything is all right. And he hands her something. And look what Lucy remembers. Um, he handed her the spectacles wrapped only in a thin silk handkerchief through which she could see and discern their shape. Quote, I've got a key, the Nephite interpreters, Joseph told his mother when he came back that evening. And she, quote, took the article of which he spoke into her hands, and she examined it. She described the seer stones as two, quote, three-cornered stones set in, quote, silver bows connected with each other like old-fashioned spectacles. So Lucy not only gets to handle the spectacles, but she also handles uh, the breastplate as well. These are the beginning of tangible interactions with real uh, grounded artifacts, where Joseph says the Book of Mormon's coming from. Another interesting story is uh, many of you in here, I'm sure, have been to Palmyra and been to the Smith, the frame home, and gone to the, the fireplace. Um, and you've heard the story when Joseph has to hide the plates in the, under the hearthstones. Well, the reason why is because after Joseph attained the plates, once again, Samuel Lawrence and Willow Chase, they wanted the plates. They felt like they had either a right to them or that they deserved them somehow as well. And so they hire what Brigham Young recollects was a great rodsman or somebody who could use divining rods to locate uh, water, a water witcher, or precious ores, precious metals. And um, as you can see here, Samuel Lawrence and a great rodsman came to Joseph Smith Sr.'s home and tried to bargain with Joseph Smith, quote, to go shares. He even says to him, you got to go shares with me, Joe, is his quote meaning we've got to go into business with this together. When Joseph refused, and by the way, Joseph knew that people were coming to try to get the plates, and that's why he, he unearthed the hearthstones to the fireplace, buried them, put them under the fireplace. And can, by the way, just picture this. You've buried them. Samuel Lawrence shows up with this great rodsman who Brigham Young, I love this right here, and only the way Brigham can describe it. This rodsman, quote, was a wicked man having possessed as much talent as any man that walked on the American soil. Brigham Young's like, this, this was a, he was a great conjurer, is what he called him. So now picture Joseph in probably the room where he's buried the plates. And Samuel Lawrence is saying, you've got to go shares with me. And Joseph says, no, and I won't tell you where they're at. And all of a sudden, the great rodsman, this conjurer, pulls out his divining rods, and they point right to the hearth. To the fireplace and look at the rodsman said he, he quote took out his rods and held them up and they pointed down to the hearth where they were hid this is joseph knight's recollection the rodsman proclaimed it's under the hearth now we don't have a record of what happened next wouldn't you like to know the next scene it's under the hearth and joseph's like no it's not <laughs> you know what does he say or does he stand up and flex his muscles a little bit and say it's time for you guys to leave we don't know. We don't know what went on. But uh, once again, here is, and here's my, here's my question again. For those who want to just try to explain the Book of Mormon as inspired fiction, if Joseph didn't retrieve an actual relic, what's he hiding under the hearthstones? Because it's not just Joseph who says he did it. Another one of his friends named Al the Beeman says, I helped Joseph dig up the hearthstones. What's he putting in there if he hasn't retrieved an actual record? And what is the conjurer uh, pointing towards? Uh, when, he, when he says they're, they're under the hearth. Okay, we also know another famous story during this protection period is uh, they continue, primarily Willow Chase, Samuel Lawrence, and Sally Chase, Willow Chase's sister, they continue to want to get the Book of Mormon from Joseph Smith, the plates. And so many of us who have been to Palmyra have also seen the Cooper shop. And um, one of the stories is that Joseph hides the plates in the Cooper shop up in the loft. And he, when he gets ready to, to hide them, he takes them, and you can see here, Joseph hid the plates in the loft of the family's cooper shop where Sally Lawrence, led by her green seer stone, she had a seer stone as well, searched that night. Joseph hid the plates in the loft, but nailed an 
empty box shut and hid it in the floorboards. So you can almost picture Joseph knowing they're going to come try to find him and wondering where to put it. So he nails a box closed and digs up the floorboards and puts it there and then hides up in the loft the actual plates up there. The next morning, Joseph found the floor of the cooper shop torn up and the box which was laid under it shivered to pieces. Uh, but the plates were safe in the loft. Once again, what's Joseph hiding uh, if the plates are not tangible and real? Well, I want to move on to some who actually hefted. One of the things that Joseph would do was because he was given the divine charge to not let anybody see the plates, Joseph, and what I think is a creative, uh, you know, it, it's almost like, well, you didn't say I couldn't do this. So Joseph is going to put the plates in a box, a locked box, and let people heft the box to say, well, I can't let you see the plates, but know that I have them. Pick this up, and you can heft them. One of the first people to have this happen was actually Lucy Harris, Martin Harris's wife. Joseph had reached out to the Harrises um, to see if they would support him in the translation of the Book of Mormon. And Lucy Harris didn't want to be duped. She wanted to make sure Joseph actually had a record. So she shows up at the Smith home. And she asks Joseph, that I want to see the plates before we commit any money. Or before I commit any money, I want to see them. And Joseph says, I, I can't let you see them. The angel said no. And then look what Lucy says right here. Quote, now Joseph. Are you not telling me a lie? Can you, look full, can you look full in my eye and say before God that you have in reality found a record as you pretend? Joseph then says, well, I'll let you do this. And he brings her the box with the plates in it. And Joseph allowed her to lift the box where the plates were locked inside. Martin Harris recalled that his daughter, because it wasn't just Lucy who got to do that, it was also their daughter, the Harris's daughter. Both of them picked up the box and hefted it. His daughter said they were about as much as she could lift. My wife said they were very heavy. Now, this didn't convince Lucy. We know that uh, many of us know the rest of the story of Lucy Harris. But at minimum, she could say, yeah, I, I picked up the box that the plates were in, and his daughter said that as well. This is also going to be Martin Harris's first interaction with the Book of Mormon, with a tangible artifact. Martin Harris is then going to come over to the Smith's house himself, He's going to grab different members of the Smith family and almost like a police investigator, interview them one by one to see if their stories corroborate or if they contradict. When he sees that all their stories are consistent, he then asks Joseph if he can see the plates. And Joseph says no, but Joseph gives Martin the same. He says, I'll let you lift them in the box. This is what Martin remembers. While at Mr. Smith's, I hefted the plates. And I knew from the heft that they were lead or gold. And, I, knew, and I, lo I love this, by the way. And I knew that Joseph had not credit enough to buy so much lead. That's important, by the way, because there will be some people, uh, such as Fawn Brody, who later say, Joseph made up the Book of Mormon, and then, almost as a prop to support his story, fabricated a set of plates. Because all these people have these tangible interactions. They say, well... He went back and he, and he made it, he fabricated, he went out there and became an iron worker and made his own metal plates. And I, well, Number one, that's, that's requiring a far stretch of the imagination that Joseph's out doing that to a, to a family that can't even make their mortgage payment, by the way, on a home they're about to lose, that they're going to spend any money they do have to get a bunch of lead or metal to make a prop to support a story. I like this statement from Martin Harris, who knew the Smith family intimately, that says they didn't have any credit or money that Joseph could fabricate metal plates. So he goes on to say, I left Mr. Mr. Smith's about 11 o'clock and went home. I retired to my bedroom and prayed God show me concerning these things. And I covenanted that if it was his work and he would show me so, I would put forth my best ability to bring it before the world. He then showed me that it was his work and Martin Harris had a divine uh, manifestation himself that the book was true. Okay. Now, Martin... Lucy and their daughter weren't the only ones who also hefted the box. Uh, Alva Beeman, or old Mr. Beeman, also, uh, who helped Joseph secrete the plates in the, in the hearthstones, also did. Look what Alva Beeman remembers. Beeman related to Martin Harris that, quote, he heard them jink. That's an interesting phraseology. But he was not permitted to see them. In the same interview, Harris stated that he um, um, also hefted the plates many times and should think that they weighed 40 or 50 pounds. So now you also have Alma Beeman who says, I didn't see the plates, but I picked up the box and shifted them enough 
that he heard a metallic jink or a sound in there. Okay. So some interesting stories there. Um, I also, one other one that I don't have here that I'll just share. Another person who hefted the box was Joseph's father-in-law, Isaac Hale, who did not believe Joseph's story. And when Joseph went to live um, on the Hale property, when him and Emma moved to Harmony, Pennsylvania, Isaac Hale says, well, he hears that Joseph has brought plates. And he says, well, if you have anything in my house, uh, I need to know of it and see it. And Joseph says, can't let you see it. But he lets Isaac Hale also heft the box. And Isaac Hale says, yeah, I, I picked up the box and, and judged that, that there was something in there at minimum. Okay. Well, aside from hefting the box, because that's one thing, you know, according to, um, his name slipped in my mind right now. Somebody remind me. Oh, Peter Ingersoll. According to Peter Ingersoll, Peter Ingersoll in Mormonism Unveiled, uh, which is really the first anti-Mormon book that comes out, Ingersoll says, Joseph just went and got a bunch of sand and filled up his frock full of sand and put, and put that, and that Joseph says, now I've got everybody fooled. Well, you're, I'm going to show you these accounts. They don't jive with him getting a bag of sand, nor does accounts of hefting a box and hearing him jink. The following are some of the people who said, no, I actually touched the plates. They were metallic. And we're going to pick up with Joseph's little sister. Her name's Catherine. And here's a picture of Catherine later on in her life. Um, Catherine recollects that Joseph left the plates on a table wrapped up. And she, quote, saw a package on the table concerning, containing the gold plates, which she picked up to judge the weight, finding them, quote, heavy like gold. Through the package of cloth, look at her, what she says right here, quote, she rippled her fingers up the edge of the plates and felt that they were separate metal plates and heard the tinkle of the sound that they made. What a fascinating, uh, tangible witness. And not only does she see them wrapped, she get, I mean, she's having a sensory experience with her hands, her eyes, and her ears of an actual metallic record that her brother has brought home. This is Joseph's little brother, William, his, his, his fist-fighting, dueling brother. Um, and William was only a teenager. I think if I remember right, William was 16 at the time that Joseph brings the plates home. And look what William says as well. When he was a teenager, he, recount, he remembers back to when he was a teenager and Joseph brought him home. Quote, he hefted the plates as they lay on the table, wrapped in an old frock or jacket in which Joseph had brought them home. You see the consistency of their accounts here. And that he, quote, had thumbed them through the cloth and ascertained that they were thin sheets of some kind of metal, is his recollection there. Emma Smith also um, has her own witness uh, same, same of touching the plates. Look what Emma says. This is later on in her life in an interview with Joseph Smith III, uh, Joseph and Emma's son. She recollects back that, quote, the plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, uh, wrapped in a linen cloth. She also recalled, I once felt of the plates as they thus lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. They seemed to be pliable, like, and I like hers, pliable, like, like thick paper, and would rustle with a metallic sound when the edges were moved by the thumb, as one does sometimes thumb the edges of a book. I was talking with my wife last night, and she goes, I don't know if I would have had the willpower not to just lift up that cloth and take a peek. And by the way, I think, just on a side note, in this same interview, Joseph III says, basically, were you ever tempted to look? And she says, no, I was satisfied that he had obtained the record. Section 25 hints that maybe not, though. Um, it tells her not to murmur because of the things that have been withheld from her view. Um, so maybe she did wish she could actually see the plates. But she says, I was convinced at minimum he had a record. And I think part of it is she saw it. And another one, she says that often when she was cleaning around the house, that she would have to move the plates, you know. Once again, I couldn't do that. Oh, whoopsie, <laughs> my bad, you know. 
she says she would move the plates and she knew he had a record. But I love this, that she says, I also thumbed them. Felt individual sheets or pages in there. I knew that Joseph had them, these are her words, and was not especially curious about them. I did not attempt to handle the plates other than I have told you, nor uncover them to look at them. I was satisfied that it was the work of God and therefore did not feel it necessary to do so. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, these are just a few accounts. This is during roughly a three-month time period. And we just went through numerous people, Lucy Harris, their daughter, Martin Harris, Alva Beeman, in their own way, Samuel Lawrence, Willard Chase, Emma Smith, Catherine Smith, Emma Smith, Joseph's mother, Lucy Smith. What are they interacting with? If this is stuff worked as fiction, if there really wasn't a divine record, what is Joseph saying that he buried in hearthstones and cooper shops? What did he put in barrels of beans, by the way, when he had to travel to Harmony and hide them from people who were trying to get them from him still? It's my testimony that all of these taken together corroborate and certify that Joseph is working with a literal record, uh, with a tangible record. I like what Terrell Given says here. At, at minimum, look what he says. Uh, one is led to logically deduce, as Terrell Givens said, that at minimum, quote, what emerges as alone indisputable is the fact that Joseph Smith did possess a set of metal plates. A set of metal plates that three witnesses will later go on to have a divine experience seeing and that eight witnesses will have just a ordinary put them out on a log look at them experience certifying that Joseph had them. There were those brothers and sisters who could not believe that our Lord Jesus Christ bodily resurrected. It was too much for them. It was too beyond the realm of logical believability that someone that they had watched be nailed to a cross and bleed to death and die and have a spear shoved through his side, placed in a tomb and, and gone. That when Mary and the other Mary, when they run to the apostles and say, no, he is alive, bodily resurrected, we have seen him. His body has been taken up again. They couldn't believe it. It was, it was too much beyond their own logic of comprehension. Okay, and look what it says here in Luke. Even some of the apostles, quote, dismissed it as idle tales, and they believed it not. And the Lord would later appear to them, and in, like he says in Luke 24, 36 to 39, handle me, handle me and see. This is not just a spirit. I am a tangible person. I have a body of flesh and bone. Brothers and sisters, just like those who had a tangible experience certifying a miracle of the resurrected Lord and his bodily resurrection, it's my witness that the Book of Mormon is true. It's my witness based off those who were witnesses of a real artifact that they also hefted, handled, touched, and saw that the record of the Book of Mormon is true as well. It's a historical artifact um, that Joseph worked from, that God prepared for him, and it's miraculous. And I leave that th those things with you and bear you my testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.